don't see it, but oh, there you are. There's a chat line. Uh, so we're just gonna, yep, it's still clicking along. So we'll give it a minute. Um, so just post where you're from in the chat. We'd love to know, just kind of gives us a feel where I've been moving around the times of the, oh, yay, see it's recording. Yes, I have the record button on it. <laughs> uh, Pittsburgh, Colorado. So I'm trying to move these Zoom meetings around to hit different countries. Hang on, I'm just moving my water so I don't kick it over like I did the last time. Um, so Pennsylvania, California. This is awesome. Um, and so today we're at one o'clock, but I will, um, hopefully I might even have Laura back in a, in a couple of weeks and we'll do it at a different time zone, just again, to be able to roll this along and catch people in different places. So um, welcome everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch. I'm hosting these Zoom meetings. I have one every day this week. So today uh, through Friday, um, today it's Laura Plunkett, and I'm so happy to have her with us. Um, I'll let Laura start by giving you a little bit of her background um, before we kind of roll into what we're going to do today. So, Laura, I'm just going to put the spotlight on you. All right. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, well, my background, I've been working intuitively for a long time and been riding since I was three or four and eventually put those together and learned how to talk to primarily horses, but I talk to all kinds of animals. And I would say that I'm here today because um, love Wendy. We'll get to talk a lot about pads and the, what it's been like to be able to combine the equine communication with the pads and with the other things I've learned from Wendy. So it's going to be fun to tell some stories. And also, Wendy and I had talked about the fact that there's a lot of intensity and stress and anxiety right now and that your pets, I'm sure, are feeling it and your horses. So I thought I might spend a little bit of time talking about some ways you might be able to help those relationships. And especially if you're noticing anything, like a lot of my clients, I'm getting calls saying that they're having, uh, their animals are actually showing a lot of different behaviors than they've ever seen before. So we can talk about that. All right, so um, I'm just gonna cancel everything. So I first met Laura, I thought I'd cancel the spotlight, but we'll just, it's okay, we'll go, there we go. Um, I met Laura on Martha's Vineyard. I went up to the Misty Meadows Equine Learning Center and um, I think it was the second or third time I went, it was in the fall and um, you were there to talk to the horses at Misty Meadows and that's how we met. And it was interesting because uh, I've worked with animal communicators in the past, but this was an opportunity where I had just met the horses. No, you sent me an audio from the mule. Yes, from Zebby. From Zebby. Yeah. You sent me an um, uh, audio from Zebby before I met you. Um, he had talked about me being there and I hadn't really even met Zebby. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I went there and I met you in person and we worked with some of the horses at Misty Meadows and I'd already kind of known them at that point. So um, what you were telling me felt really right because I'd actually known the horses a little bit. But the, the story that really um, I wanted to share with meeting Laura was that um, there was another time I was going to Misty Meadows and I drove from Virginia to Pennsylvania to my friend's house <laughs> um, and the next morning, I went out to my car to find that my um, cookie bag, it's the, oh, what's the brand? You know, they're really great ginger cookies that um, are soft and chewy. They're made up where you are in the, in the white and green bags. It'll come to me. Um, but anyway, they were in the back seat on the floor. And I noticed that there was all this little white paper. And it turned out that the mice were in my car and they had eaten into the cookies. So the night before when I closed the car, the bag was fine. And then the next day, um, <laughs> clearly the mice had been chewing on the cookies. So my friend Fran got in the car with me and we drove up to Martha's Vineyard and I got there and I came over to you and I told you about these mice. And I said, if they don't leave, I'm gonna have to set a trap because I just can't have mice in my car all the time. Right? And so I, um, uh, you, you talk to them and uh, you explained to them the situation that they couldn't live in my car and that they needed to leave. And that what I was supposed to do was leave the door open at night when I went to sleep so they could get out. So that night I was staying in the log cabin and I was with Fran and I left the doors and I left the doors wide open. 
I wasn't going to take any chances. And it was a really cold night. Um, and I have never had a mouse problem in my car since. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that they laugh because otherwise I would have noticed because I've still left food in my car since then. Um, and there's been no mice problem. So um, thank you, Laura, for helping me extricate the mice from my car. And one of the things for those of you who haven't in person seen Wendy in action is her car is very full. So yes. there was no way we were gonna, with all the equipment you had in there, there was no way we were gonna do it any other way. So. No, cause I care, I have a Prius V and it's when I go to Martha's Vineyard, it's packed full. There isn't actually any spare room, especially when I put Franny in there with her stuff. So we're kind of tight. Yeah. All right, so should we, can we talk a little bit about the times everyone's going through now? Yeah, I think it's a good place to start. And I'm going to put the spotlight back on you. Okay, thanks. I even wrote a few things down because my phone's ringing off the hook. Um, and so I'm going to name a few things that people have noticed and then talk about uh, what you might be able to do about it because we're in a time of high anxiety. And meanwhile, our animals have mostly no idea um, why we're all of a sudden acting differently. I had a friend call me whose dog uh, she thought was having seizures and she did a video because she said, why is he standing in my kitchen shaking like this? Um, and when I connected with him and I'll talk a little bit about that, but when I asked him what's going on, um, all I could feel my adrenal. So I feel things in my body as well as hear things. And my adrenals were shot, meaning that his adrenals were shot. And I realized that where normally, um, he said, he said, well, she's yelling at me. And um, where normally he would be fine with being told to get out of the kitchen, um, it was setting off, he was so depleted adrenally that then it was setting off these weird shaking behaviors. And she said to me, yes, he's right. It only comes on once I spoke to him sternly. So that was one weird thing. Um, one of my clients, the dog is following the owner around and will not um, leave her alone just with this real hangdog look. And um, you may notice your horses, I've gotten a few calls about horses biting when they've never bit before. The, the biting is an interesting one because when we're worried, um, our animals ramp up in order to try to get our attention because when they can get our attention, we get present and we, we feel more recognizable to them. And so like a toddler, you'll find you're, you might hear whining out of your dog. You might feel um, your cat all of a sudden is in your face or scratching you. And horses, you know, it can be a little bit dangerous when they're trying, they're doing a whole bunch of high headed things, um, just trying to snap you back into be with me. So, um, so I had some suggestions. And Wendy, one of the things I've always loved about working with you is that you project when I watch you with the pads or I watch you walk into an arena with an animal, with a horse, you really give a sense of confidence. Like I've got this. And we watch Sharon Wilsey do this, right? Where she knows how to stand in a way. And all of us do, if you think about it, where we are telling our horse, I've got this, right? So Wendy, you're the one that's always, you position a horse in the part of the arena that where there wasn't a lot of other things going on you are looking around, you're very aware of, of everything, and that signals to your horse, I've got this. So one of the things we can do is to just, with any of our animals, you know, really show them visibly that we've got this and we're here for them. So that, that is one. And the other thing, you know, you and I have talked about how breathing is such a significant factor. And Sharon talks about this also, that deep rib breathing, so we'll, we'll look at some photos later, and I bet you've got some, of where um, if we breathe deep, if we stop shallow breathing, you can see the horses start to expand their rib cage and to relax. So it's allowing ourselves to drop in. <sighs> I can do it myself. Um, so, um, Laura, yeah, I'm sure in a lot of cases, um, the animals are used to their, their people going to work and now their people are not going to work. All our rhythms are changing. So some, some dogs are saying to me, why does my owner afraid of the other people on the street? Oh, wow. 
Yeah. So they're picking up on this whole change of routine. Um, yeah. You know, my cats are used to us being home, so there's no change of routine for them whatsoever. You know, one of us is always home right now, the both of us are home, but they think that's double benefit because now they can ask both of us for chicken and to go yeah. out and to wake up early. Um, but I think there's probably a lot of animals that are so confused by the, the change in routine. And then on top of that, the stress that people are experiencing. And one of the things that's so natural um, but we're not taught that we can do it. Just a really easy fix is to start to think in pictures around your animals and explain things because they do literally see what we're visualizing in our head. And it's not something that you have to learn how to do. You just bring up, so um, in the case of one of my clients, she's very worried about her elderly parents. And so she's walking around and that's really her reason um, for being in a state of hang on, ha high anxiety. And so I was talking to her about picturing her parents and that worry in her head and sending it. So what I would, it's a very simple thing. You just really open your heart to your horse, for example, and you would say, I'm what in your head, you picture your parents in that there's a degree of worry about that. And really, it sounds crazy, but do it. And you'll so see. You let the horses help you ground that worry. Well, it's about being congruent. I when I fir I first learned about all of this because I was working with mustangs up in New Hampshire, a whole herd of twenty five mustangs that had been adopted and then abused and then rescued. Mm -hmm. And what I was taught when I went up for that training with Chris Kokel, some of you may have heard of that that. Um, nonprofit that they have up there. They do a lot of work with veterans. But anyway, he would take me into the field. And if I got present, he would say, okay, let's just breathe deep. We'll listen. And uh, the herd would come right around us, even though they, in the beginning, were very phobic of people. I went up one time and I had gotten a very difficult phone call and I was really freaking out when I arrived, but I wasn't going to say that to Chris. So I just sort of said, hey, how are you doing? We went in the field. The herd wanted nothing to do with me for the first time. And so he started to say, is there anything going on with you? Um, and once I explained it, he said, we need emotional congruence, not dissonance for our animals to trust us. And he just said to me, Laura, if you're upset, all you need to do is feel upset and they will trust you. And so in the field, I relaxed into it. Um, and the herd, not only came, they came the closest they had ever come to me. So when you allowed your internal and external self to be in agreement, in other words, not trying to fake it or present a happy face when really you weren't feeling happy, the animals recognized that you were congruent, that the inside and the outside were in agreement, and therefore they could then come and support you. Thank you, exactly. So, so with our animals, then our cats and our dogs, one of the things I was thinking is that they're so used to having their own space. And now, you know, with children being home and homeschooled, um, is it important to make a space for our, our pets that live in our home where they can have quiet time? Like just kind of make a little area or a room or provide, you know, like we call it the guard house. Outside our front, our back door, we have a dog house with a heating pad for the cats that we started for this winter so that if we were not home, they had a warm place to go if they, you know, say we went out and they were outside while we left. Um, but we find that they really like the guard house and that they'll alternate who's in there. Um, but it's not unusual to find one of them in the guard house, even though it's a warm day and it's sunny outside. So is that something that we could provide for our pets is um, in our indoor pets that, you know, don't have a place to go is to give them some place that's sort of theirs. Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. And of course, people each know their pet, you know, they'll be their best expert for their pet. They'll know what the pet needs. But I would say that any kind of quiet. And the other thing is we love our animals. And if we could sort of shut out the outside world for a while and let them comfort us and be there in a, in a way where we're not worried and not thinking about something else. That's probably right now the best gift we could give ourselves. And, and so what about people who uh, can't go to the barn because the, either they're on lockdown or the barns are off limits? 
how, how, what is something that they can do to make that connection with their horse and feel like there's still something, you know, a way to relate to their horses, even though they can't go? So I, I know, again, some of the things that I'm going to be saying when I was first learning this sounded very strange to me, but I have seen it over and over again, that if you show your horse, so you're saying, let's say, um, you just say, please connect me to my horse and you picture your horse in your head. And then you say to that horse, uh, this is how many nights it will be before you see me again. And now I'm realizing there's some, un there's some unknown. So, um, but if in fact you do know that like one of our local barns, it's now closed for two weeks um, based on the federal recommendations. And so what, we're, what people are doing is they're cycling in their head uh, dark light, dark light, dark light, and showing sunrise to sunset. And the reason I am sure this works is because a lot of my clients now use this when they're going on vacation and oh. they show, you know, the animal, okay, it's a weekend, so it's only two days and two nights. Well, that pet sitter will say that all of a sudden they're starting to look out the window. They know that this is the day that people are coming home. And there's a lot less anxiety. Um, and separation anxiety. So that's just a quick tip on what you could do. Great. Yeah, because, you know, some people are, are, they have their horses at home, they're able to ride or they're in a small barn. But, you know, like right now I was talking to Ida Hammer last night and oh. the barriers are able to go in, but in the bigger barns, they have to schedule and, and keep their social distance and it all has to be coordinated. Whereas in the smaller barns, it's a, it's a lot easier to be able to do that. So I know that um, there's a lot of people with a lot of different circumstances. Um, some people might be on a 14 day self isolation. So the, like I did that um, because I was traveling when this all started and I got home and um, where my horse lives, uh, it's at Dr. Joyce Harmon's house. We'll have her as a guest on Wednesday, tomorrow night. Um, but her mom is on the property and her mom is, is in her late eighties. And so I didn't go because, uh, you know, just, just for safety's sake, it was better to just stay home. Um, so I know that people are dealing with lots of different circumstances. So those are great tips that they can visualize day and night to give the horses a sense of when they'll be back. Also, I was working with a friend of mine who uh, is competing. It's called Pre-St. George, right? Did I get that right? And um, she was really upset because right in the middle of the season, she was going to have to leave and go on a trip with her husband for three weeks. And so we planned ahead and what she did was literally in her head, she rode the test every night before she went to sleep. And the, actually this was the first time, what happened was I was just trying to tell her horse for her that she was going away and where she'd be. And he said, I don't want, he's such an athlete. I love this horse, his name's Pernod. And he's one of those horses that just loves to work and loves to perform. So he said, I, wait a minute, we're in the middle. I'm an athlete, we're in the middle. And I said, well, there's nothing we can do. She has to go. And he said, ride the test, tell her to ride the test in her head. And she said, when she got back, he was more tuned up than when she left. Oh, that's awesome. You know, that, that whole idea of visualization, whether it's uh, visualization to communicate with our animals or simply visualization to communicate with ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, we used to think of that, this dates me, but it was all thought of as woo woo and really strange. And, you know, Jane Savoy came out with her with her book, um, That Willing Feeling. Um, Kim Walness, I met Kim Walness when, um, in 1986 when she was gonna head to Gawler for the World Equestrian Games and eventing and combined training. And she would, she told us about how she would literally sit in the horse's stall and picture every jump and, and communicate to herself whether or not she was, and I'm sure she was projecting to him that he got it. But we tend to write off this idea of imagination or imagery. Um, but there's so much evidence now of how effective it is. Uh, in fact, David Butler from uh, Sydney University has written a book called Explain Pain. And visualization is one of the three prongs in the three things you can do to get out of chronic pain. Um, the first being self-recognition, the second being using a mirror, and uh, many people have seen me use a mirror to help people read pattern in the brain. And then the third is imagery. And so, you know, there's so much evidence now about how effective imagery is. And this is just simply kind of redirecting it a little bit to project our imagery rather than just simply thinking about it for ourselves. 
Yeah. And let's not forget pads. Yes. Because <laughs> you and I, I put my mother, I hope she's not watching this. I put her on the pads <laughs> and she was calmer than I've ever seen her. And you've used these with other animals, not just horses. Right. So if you, if any of you have the pads at home, literally get on them because the they help your nervous system. Right? Yeah, and so Laura's talking about the Surefoot equine pads, and yeah. we've used them for uh, dogs. We find cats gravitate to them, um, yeah. and people, and have some really interesting stories with people. I had a woman who had a head injury from a riding accident when I was in New Zealand, and we put her on the pad, and her headache instantly went away, and then she slept really deeply for a couple hours twice that day, and was so much better the next time I saw her. So. Um, so yeah, there's lots of benefits. Um, so if anybody has any questions about what you can do to help your animals and yourself through this period with the pandemic, uh, just type a question in there. Anybody can type in a question and then either Laura and I can read it. Um, otherwise, we're just going to go on and she's going to do a little screen share here. I'm going to talk about some other things. Awesome. Here we go. So I want to, can you see it now? So Wendy and I, when we were talking about doing this, we really, my, what I'm fascinated with is the combination of the animal communication and the conversations I've had, and then also using the pads. So uh, I was going to, I'm going to tell a couple of stories and then um, we're going to answer your questions about that also. And I think Wendy had some uh, videos she wanted to show. So I'm going to start with this one. And this is about a horse I worked with. His name is Hunter. And Hunter, Hunter was a, when I met him, he was, I think, around 17, and he had been, that doesn't make sense, he must have been 18, and he had been a lesson horse for 15 years in a jumping program at a barn. And my friend called me and said, I have this white horse, I brought my own horse into my backyard and I'll show you her backyard if you can believe this, it's so beautiful. So she said, I've got uh, two horses here. They've been here since June, it's August. I don't know what to do with him. He was loaned to me, that's her horse that you're seeing. And this is her property. And I show you this because they, she had moved these horses there in June. And in August, when she called me, this is the scene I always saw, I would arrive and the uh, black horse would be visible, but the white horse, Hunter, uh, in those three months had not, or two months, had not warmed up. Um, and the two horses didn't get along, and he was a little bit unapproachable. He was, he was not dangerous, but he would put his ears back and turn away, um, and she hadn't had the opportunity to do much with him, and now she was wondering, what am I gonna do with this horse? He had been loaned to her as a, turn, as a buddy for her horse, but now uh, she was heading back to her regular barn and she couldn't think of who would be able to spend time with this horse, so I showed up. Now the first thing, when I got there, as I showed you that picture, he, he, was, he would be wherever people weren't. And slowly over time, I, all I did was go and stand next to him, talk to him, he'd have his ears back, um, he would, he would freeze. He would get in that state. You talk about that, Wendy, a lot, that freeze state. It looks like the horse is, is happy or giving in or peaceful, but really his jaw was set. His breathing was tight. His muscles were tight. And that is not a, I didn't want to force it. So I would just, I spent uh, some time doing that. And then I also communicated with him and he told me his story. And his story was really about being very successful loving being a lesson horse, being very athletically comfortable. And then over time in that program, as he aged in it, um, he told me he had more and more pain in his back and his left hind, and that no one had stopped riding him and that the pressure was awful. And finally that um, he had started bucking and no one liked him anymore and he was failing and then he had been kicked out. So that was his version of what had happened. And I told him, well, we care about you, we're here for you, you're not being asked to do that anymore, but we do need to know what you want. And he basically 
didn't have, he had no idea. He had never been anywhere but this one place. So the, so along with talking to him, I did that thing that you do, which is, uh, and what Sharon does, which is I walked around the four corners of him and I looked in all directions and I showed him that I was paying attention to his surroundings and that I was in charge and he could be safe and I wasn't going to go into his bubble of space, but that I had the perimeter. And this is that first time that I did it. Watch what happened. This is the two of them. I'm so glad I was able to capture it. They finally, when he felt safe enough in his environment, they finally made friends and they are the dearest of friends now. So in other words, after you made the safe space for the horse, suddenly he realized that then he could let down and actually enjoy the company of his friend. And they are to this day thick as thieves since then, but they, for two months they hadn't um, made a connection. And so you just used one of Sharon, we'll, we'll have Sharon Wilsey back on a Zoom meeting Good. next week on, the, on Monday. So um, basically you were just holding the space for them so that they could feel comfortable. And then, what I did was, so he started to like being next to me. And so then I would put a halter on my shoulder and, and I would approach him and he would take off. And finally I got so that he knew that he, he had choices. And then he let me put the halter on and then he would let me lead him around. But this, I'm talking incrementally, right? Because anything that made him feel trapped, it's not that he was unwilling he wasn't alive when he was doing it it was just that learned helplessness of tension and misery so wendy here you go i put him on pads he loved them um but i want to show everybody something we you and i have talked about how i can feel what's happening in a horse when they're on the pads yep okay so if you look at the back and let me see if i can can you see my pointer yes, absolutely okay see this ridge yeah so when I, and this, so when I look with soft eyes, the pain there is, is so intense. And there's some right here in the stifle area. I'm gonna, I think I put a thing, yeah. So not this padding, this underneath, and you, you know anatomy so much better. All at this level and down here, which I gather is got to do with the hamstrings. Yeah, that's hamstrings and down into gastrox and uh, glute medius over the top. So this, um, this one, and this isn't much of a video, let me just pass through it. Um, the, so even standing with the front ones, he, okay, so what I will say is he sighed and he took deep breaths and he rocked back and forth, but I still didn't get any release in that back area. And then just putting this, this one right here where he's just got the toe on the slant, um, that was the first time I felt any kind of relaxation of those muscles I just showed you. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> at the, can you see around his eye and just, this was the next day. Um, and then, oh, okay. So I guess I don't, what I wanted to tell everybody is that the real landmark, can you see me also? Um, yes. The real landmark moment was when I had two slants in the back and I could feel him. It was, you could watch him rock back and forth as he reset his pelvis. Um, and therefore, so I should also back up and say this horse was lame when I met him visibly. So there's a, I could see him shifting and relocating and what, and the sighing and the shaking and the moaning and all that stuff was so beautiful to watch. And that was the first time I saw some relief of that muscle tension. And here, was after that day. This was the next, this is a horse who showed no pleasure beforehand, no connection, just, and, and um, now watch to the very end. So do you think he's actually trying to massage those muscles there a little watch bit? Watch this, see that last one? Yeah. That makes my spine shake now. <laughs> yes, I think he was trying to release the muscles, but also. Then he shook it off. That shake, it makes me, when it resets my nervous system, that one at the very end. Did you notice that? Where he just really went into that crazy spasmy type thing. Yep. To me, that was such a huge release and a turning point. And this is him. Now, I indulge myself by putting this photo in because this horse has just lost 
his full-time lease situation and he's available. So as I tell you about this story, um, anyone out there, he is in Massachusetts and we are looking for, he is, so first of all, he's bomb proof. But now after that day, Wendy, and I have used the pad subsequently, but after that day, no more lameness. Wow. Um, and he, oh, he's a dream to ride. I ride him bareback. They said he was unrideable and I ride him in a halter and bareback. Okay, here. You'd and his body just looks so much softer there all over. Oh yeah, you can see, right? See this line? I mean, it's a little hard, but let me, let me show you this. So, we're, but what's so amazing to me is how the pads and the communication and the attention, the, watch his attitude because this is now who he is. Just turn your volume off on the video. Uh, you see the volume right there on the screen? Yep. Sorry about that. That's okay. There you go. You got it. So it's really nice to, to see and hear how like the combination of Sharon Wilsey's ideas and the basically being present. And what I teach people with the pads to do is to really be present and simply observe without layering on any of uh, any stories, I call it. Yeah. Um, horses, Sharon talks about how simple the horse's mind is, and so does Dr. Peters, that they're, they're, they're very present, but they don't elaborate a lot of stuff. And so this horse now, he just looks really quite uh, enjoying that uh, level of connection with you that we're seeing. And I couldn't, he wouldn't let me touch his face. I mean, this was a horse, you couldn't get near him. For, so right. it's exciting. So when you, somebody asked about, let's see, is there, um, somebody was asking, like, is there a way to communicate therapy to a horse that got injured prior to lockdown? And can you visualize the, uh, the horse on the pads? And I texted them, I chatted with them and said, absolutely. But maybe you can talk to people about a little bit about a body scan, because I know that that's one of the first things you do and something that I think we're all capable, because you were talking about that gray horse and and feeling the different things. So can you talk a little bit more about a body scan? Definitely. Um, and, and I have all of this. So I have a website, lpconnections.com, and there is a 14 minute exercise that you can do. So um, if, if, the, if you wanna um, LP practice, Connections. lpconnections.com. Okay, I'm putting that in the chat. Great, because that, that's, I've made a mini course basically. Um, and so people can do this on their own and it's, it's not, I feel like all it, all it needs is some practice and some mindfulness. So, you know what, Wendy, do you have a picture just of a horse trotting? Uh, I'm sure I do. Let me look for one while. Okay. Um, so what I would say to people is that the most amazing thing out of all the lessons I've learned from working with horses in this way. I cannot believe the detail I can get in my body about a horse that might be in Germany, it might be in California. And I'm sitting here in Massachusetts. And when I ask, so I say, please make, please, I want to make a connection. And I mention the name of the horse, or I picture the horse in my head. And then I ask that horse when I feel I've made a connection to let me know in my body how they feel. And that's what I call a body scan. So if I've got a an owner that wants me to talk to their horse, I try to say, please don't tell me anything so that you're not trying to think your way through it. And I just make the connection, ask the horse how they feel. And it is fascinating to me that I can feel short of breath. I can feel just my right hand, which would be the right front of the horse hurting. And so I just hope you believe in it enough so that you've let yourself get quiet in your mind, think about your animal, and just notice, so the first part is to see how your baseline is, and then notice any changes to that baseline. And we're not saying, I'm not saying I'm a vet or that you have to go with your initial feelings. It's just something to check out. So with Hunter in that story, you know, I can look at that picture and say, oh, those muscles are tight. But then all I have to do is go over there and get, you know, a little bit of an elbow in and, of course, you know, and, and verify. So that's how you do a body scan. You basically make a connection in your mind. And as I said, I, I have a 14 minute one where you can um, spend a lot more time and make a really clear connection. 
you check how you're feeling and then you ask for your animal to give you those sensations and then you ask for it to stop at the end. All right, I think I have, let me just scan this video forward. Uh, that's the walk. You know what I realized? I could also. Oh yeah, I have a video for trot. Cool. Okay. okay. Uh, so I'm going to pause that and I'm going to jump back over here and I'm going to do a screen share. So this is just a, I, I'm just going through my files and I just found a random trot yeah. video. So what I would say is suspend disbelief and just watch this horse move around and see if your eyes, um, if you give it a little bit of a soft eye, I don't know if we're going to be. She'll get closer. My, it's breaking up, it's not smooth, so I can't. Oh. Let me, um, you know what, I have one. Okay. Hold on. Do you mind if I just? Nope. Is that okay? Okay. Yep. Um, let me go to. You're in change the name as opposed to, just click on that file again. Yeah. Just so, so, whoops. Let me just find the one. I have to let Lily out. So you keep going while you're looking. All right. Um, so everyone, just just watch this. This is a this is another example of just loving a horse and talking to them, a horse that had had a lot of in, uh, relationship problems, and how much he just wanted to be close with no pressure. But just let yourself look at his his anatomy and the stride. I hope I can give you enough of a and see if your mind goes to anywhere that you think he has tightness. I know this is not a fair, this is this also. It's okay, fair. it's just giving people the idea of how to do it. So yeah. I have a feeling, just that little bit that I saw that there's some tightness in the hind quarters. Yeah, yep, me too. And, and hind, like starting right here. Yep. And then, yeah, going right down, which is so common, right, so. Well, and sometimes what I just look for is I look for lines that aren't, uh, that don't make sense. In other words, you know, typically a body that's moving easily would be quite smooth. And when you see sort of a, a hard line or a straight line or a tight line, then that attracts my eye. I think mm -hmm. when, when we're trying to look at things, one of the things that I actually tell people do is to, um, we tend to be attracted to movement, but the places that we really need to look at are the places that aren't moving. And a lot of times we don't actually notice them until they start moving again. And this is one of the things that I find with the surefoot pads that's so fascinating is that I'll watch a horse and I'll see him moving and, and I'll go, okay, that's fine. And then I put him on the pads and then he walks off and suddenly I see movement in a new place. And the first question I ask myself is, what was that like before? Because I didn't notice, I just notice now that it's moving in a new way, but then I can't remember what it looked like because I wasn't drawn to it because it wasn't moving and so that's it's oh so much of this is about um a putting aside judgment for a minute and then b just allowing ourselves to perceive without that judgment of whether that's you know thinking of a picture and projecting that to my animal or whether that's looking at a horse or a rider and just kind of not trying to analyze not hard eyes not that's it but to just kind of let an impression happen. Um, Tony Gonzalez used to say that after eight seconds, you have to look away. That after eight seconds, we're starting to stare. And whether that's, you know, for everything, whether that's looking at a picture or getting a feeling from a picture or getting a feeling from an animal, the harder we stare, actually, the less we can sense because we've gotten kind of too intense about it. Yeah. So there's that, so that eight second rule. Definitely. Should I show, should I do another story? Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's go to one more because it's another great combination. We haven't had anybody put any questions in the chat. So folks, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat and then I can either text an answer or we can ask uh, Laura to give us an answer. But I think you probably have some, so yeah. Oh, you've got all kinds of things. Go for it. Okay. So this is Jasper who you have met, Wendy. Yep. Jasper came to Misty Meadows, <clears throat> the Aquine Riding Center where we met. He came as number seven. He came from a sale barn. He didn't have a name. He didn't have a history. 
Um, and they got him because he was point and shoot. They got on him. He did walk, trot, canter, no problem. Um, he didn't react to sounds and uh, he didn't, you know, flinch when they did all kinds of desensitization tests. And then they got him. And I will show you, this was, this is sort of how he was, that no matter what you did, they just tried to get a rise out of him any way he, they could. Um, he would do what you asked, but there was just nothing else there. So you can see that. And so they asked me to come in and talk to him. His, the history that he told me is that he was Western broke, um, that he had been in a place where it was just one rider after another and um, had had some pretty hard knocks in terms of nutrition and other things. And um, I decided, so we started with pads. And I spent almost a week with this horse. I visited him every day. And he would stand in the beginning, this is it. You put him on pads, he'd stand on pads. Um, but over time, oh, let me back up. So the thing that would happen with this horse is he had a vitamin E deficiency, which we didn't know at the time, but he had that total adrenal fatigue. And so the first time I put him on pads, he started to lay down in the aisle. So from then on, oh wow, we, I, I created all these situations where I would put him on pads that week and then he would take a nap. Um, and this is, you can see his cribbing collar because he was so Wait, anxious. Hang on a second, Laura, because some people apparently can't see your screen. Oh. Um, if you cannot see Laura's screen, just pop it in the chat. Um, it looks like there's two people that can't see her screen. You can see it. Okay, so if you cannot see it, let us know. Um, and maybe what we have to do is unshare and reshare her screen. Um, do you want me to do that? Uh, yeah, there's people that can't. So just unshare and then reshare your screen and we'll see if we can get Sorry that. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, okay. here we go. How's we have the chat so we can make sure we keep in touch with people. Exactly. So hopefully, let me go back just to these little funny see. Oh, yep. is it going to let me? Okay. So these are the ones I was showing. I would, he would get on the pads and then he would take a nappy. And that was it. So you could see me laying there, sitting there with him. We would hang out. These were all our sessions, Wendy. So he, and you'll notice so here every by the time you did the pads with him, he would lay down afterward. So many horses do this, especially because you should see my phone's full of horses laying down because I talk to them and I do the pads, and the relaxation goes through them to the point where they sort of. So uh, that's so interesting because you're mostly working with horses that are obviously either loose or not under saddle. Um, right. I've had some lay down, but mostly I'm working under saddle. So this is kind of fascinating that you have so many horses yeah. uh, lay down like that. Yeah, and he would take a nap, but you'll notice no cribbing strap because as the week went on, his anxiety got less. How cool. And now, so this is a horse that- Just I, mute your, your sound on that video, okay? Yes, good point. Um, so this is a horse it also, who you saw in the beginning, he really didn't care about people, right? So he had no emotion, and he's at a at a therapeutic riding board barn where the horses want, well, the kids want, you know, they like quirky horses, they like affectionate horses, they like reaction, and this horse had none, and no real interest in people. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there really wasn't much of a um, spark. And so this was at the end of the week, it was the only video I could find, but a, a couple things happened. He got a lot more comfortable in his body during that week. And then he just started to want to follow me around like a little puppy. So here you go. Again, the nice big release after his yeah. nap. And Sharon talks about that shake is like shaking it off. Um, yeah. Also people that when they talk about the vagal nerve response, they talk about shaking it off. And so that's interesting to see that you get those kinds of responses and that you get so many horses relaxing and laying down. This is Lily laying down. So this is another great story that's real short where they called me, same barn. They had got her at a sale barn and she was so anxious when I, I, I got her out of the field. She was, she was high headed and she had good ground manners in the sense that I wasn't scared, but she was calling to the other horses and doing this huge revolution, you know, just um, walking really anxiously around this round pen. 
And then I had the pads there and I talked to her and I said, we're here for you. Um, we, we just want to know what you like and don't like. I talked to her, do you like kids? Um, this is what you're always going to have enough food. And, um, these are pads and she got right on the pads, even though she had been really agitated before. And then she lay down. And then when I asked her, do you like to be ridden? Now, if you guys look right here, she said, no, because my legs are driving me crazy. Now this is anaplasmosis, we came to find out. And look how swollen and red and itchy. Um, so she needed a lot of vet care, but she turned out to really love children and be a great asset. So um, hang on, I'm just, there's a couple people that can't see your screen, but I'm wondering if it's their internet connection. Um, so, um, because it only seems to be three people. And so we're just going to continue on here. Um, okay. I've had a couple questions. Okay. And, um, one of them was, they're kind of similar questions. Yeah. Um, one of them has a horse that had anaplasmosis and he's having a very slow recovery and he seems lethargic and depressed. And she grooms him and talk to him, talks to him every day and wonders what she can do. And the other one had her pony die last week and her horse, her best friend is very sad. So both of them are kind of in a bit of a depression and she did get to say goodbye and spend time with her body, but, uh, and she's buried in the pasture, but both of these horses sound like they're dealing with a bit of depression. So I wonder if you could talk about how we can help that. So there's this thing called a heart hug, which I did not make up. So someone, so I have learned it from somewhere, but it, when I feel into a horse that's really depressed, it's so perfect. And it's something that you can do if you feel like your horse needs that uh, lift, which is to put one, you can put your right hand uh, between the two front legs and your left on the withers. And just believe we are energy, we are energy and you're sending basically Reiki or an electric current from your right hand to your left. And you don't have to believe it, just do it. And um, you'll see that the horse then, they'll probably drop their head, they sigh, they yawn, um, and they love that connection. For whatever reason, that's called a heart hold. And I have seen it really bring horses to a much better place. So it also brings people to a better place. Do you know about Linda's heart hug? Linda Tellington Jones heart hug. Oh, that's where it came from? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because so so um, you know, many years ago I was into heart math. I discovered heart math. I can't remember how I found out about it. And kind of through the grapevine, Linda found out about heart math and she's really embraced it. It is the best way to put it. And she's created the heart hug where you I can't even see, but um you put your hands over your heart and you give yourself a little heart hug. Kind of you know, kind of do a little, there you can see it. It's just this little heart hug. And so essentially you're doing that for the horse, but you're connecting chest and withers, which their heart is so big and it's so deep in their body. That makes a lot of sense to flow from one to the other. And then the other thing would be to really admit you're grieving. And so to open your heart to your own pain while you're with the horse, because horses love to comfort us and they don't need us to be okay. They just want to feel useful. So many horses feel like they have a purpose in their owner's life and that they're there for a reason. And so I would say, just try to be as open with your own grief as you can be while you're doing that. And then as far as the anaplasmosis, the horse I showed you, Lily, she needed an IV to get yeah, over Yeah, this horse is on IV. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would, just, I would just, in your mind, put the IV and the fact that this is going to help and that this is the vet being, you know, on the team and on the horse's side and that the horse just has to be patient. And that's what I would have in my head. So, so one of the things that I've noticed uh, with using surefoot pads with horses is that, um, that there are so many benefits for the people. In other yeah. words, as, as I work with the pads, and I've been doing this a long time now, so I'm, I'm less affected, if you will, than I see other people. But as I'm working with the pads, um, there seems to be an energetic shift in the horses and everybody starts to get really soft and a little bit dreamy and a little bit, and they don't, they could be standing on pads while the horse is standing on pads, but they don't have to be. And, and I usually have to like only do a couple of hours working with horses in workshops because if I, and then give them a break, because if I spend too long, they're all zonked. They're all out of it. 
So can you talk a little bit about sort of the magnetic field or the energy field of the horse that when you, what happens when you use sure foot pads and, and how big is that field? Yeah. So one thing is that I think really we're all doing that little bit of a body scan without even knowing it. And so um, you do get to feel that delicious feeling in your body. Let me put this on while I'm talking. Um, you get to feel something so Just good. The sound. You, what, huh? Just mute the sound. Oh yeah, right. Because then we get all the birds. <laughs> yeah, there were swallows. Um, so this is Thomas. And you can, you can watch his eyes, you can watch his head, the little shakes, see, the, see his nostrils and the breathing. I mean, and you'll Sharon, know even- In our discussion the other day, Sharon was saying how that little twitching in the head and neck is like a reset. Um, it's really common to see, he did a little bit there a moment, there, another one, right? That she talks about a reset, that they're see, resetting something in their upper cervicals. That's right. And so if, if, when I'm doing a body scan for everybody, if you just look, this is a great example. I love the sway. I can feel him going inner, um, but I still feel the, he, his back really needs a good stretch. So I don't know if anyone else is feeling like they wish he would drop his head and um, that he's still holding on a little bit to, uh, you know, whatever he needs to hold on to in terms of stress. Well, so, and the horse is just yeah. like people, you know, they've been holding that for a long time and it becomes a habit. So the first piece is that they have to recognize their own habit before they can let it go. And I think a lot of these horses at first aren't really even recognizing their habits, but that's what starts to happen is they start to feel their habit and then they start to feel that there's another option. And when they have a choice, and that's the key is without choice, you cannot change. But when they sense that they have a choice, then they can start to change. And so what the pads are doing is offering that opportunity. And we see all these amazing side benefits of connection and relaxation and um, the energy field surrounding them seems to expand out and affect all the people that are within that sphere. I see this over and over and over. Um, that, that on an energetic level, you know, that, that the softening is pervasive um, throughout their body and throughout the bodies around. And whatever happens, you just imagine they're dropping out of fight or flight, right? Yep. So when you're with a 1,500 pounds of muscle and they just dropped out of fight or flight, it feels amazing. Yeah. Yep. So we had somebody ask a question here. How do you know that the horse is answering you and not just your imagination? Um, really from verifying. The, well... It, feels so much like thought. I have to say, it's not bells and whistles. When I get information, if you said to me, green canoe, and I teach this sometimes in my classes, I'd have people, you know, I say red fire hydrant, green canoe, and I have them pay attention to where that shows up in their head and what it feels like. It's just like that. It, it isn't so much more significant. The difference I would say is that we know when we're thinking. And when you're doing this, you're really suspending thought and you're just receiving. I don't, does that help? Yep. Um, hang on, I'm just responding to a text. And also I would say you, you really shouldn't 100% believe what you're getting. You've got to, so I just was on the phone with someone from Martha's Vineyard and I said, I'm feeling laminitis in the right front. And she said, oh good, because the vet is coming tomorrow. And then she checked it out and it was laminitis in the right front, but I would never diagnose that. I would only, it's only one piece of data that then you've got to have a professional, you know. Look well, at. and that you bring up a couple of things. One, I think it doesn't matter whether it is our imagination or if it's real. It's the fact that we're open to the possibility. Yep. Because if you doubt that you can hear, then you absolutely won't hear. Yeah. So it, you know, it's about kind of letting whatever answer comes in and then seeing, does this fit? Does this make sense? Does it fit in my known world? Um, and I've used animal communicators for many years and uh, a variety of people. And I always look at the information that they give me and how it fits in my known world. Like I've had um, some say, oh, your horse would like classical music in the barn. Well, she lives out most of the time, so that ain't happening. Um, <laughs> But you know, I've had others where I was in Switzerland and this woman, I've forgotten her name, literally the personality of each horse came through so strongly. It was like I was standing with my each horse. 
Yeah. And it, that was so obvious to me. So, and sometimes for people, those people listening now, you can just see the change in your horse right away, right? So that's another thing. You and it's also can't. a lot harder to do your own horse. It's a lot easier to do someone else's horse because we have so much emotional ties to our horses um, that we have to just kind of um, see if we can't be a little more objective and a little less tied to a result. Because when it's our own horse, we're looking, we have an expectation and we're hoping something's gonna happen. Um, someone asked, when you talk to your horse, do you speak out loud? Please explain. <laughs> um, I have a great story about that, but what I want to, I have one thing, which is the reason I made these audio tapes is because it does take, I run them as a meditation. So it takes laying down and getting quiet and that's the easiest way to learn it. So I just want to say it's harder when you're standing there talking to your horse. Um, but I have a great story, which is I talked to a mini pony and all I saw was his face. He's looking out over his stall. And at the end of the session, I said to him, is there anything else you want me to tell your mom? And he says, no, but I'll tell you something. So I said, okay, what is it? And he said, um, my mom loves my butt. She thinks it has attitude. And so she cracked up because what happens is when I'm talking to a horse, I'm then translating. I just tell the owner. And she said, every time she has friends over, she marches that pony out and she goes, look at his butt. Doesn't it have attitude? <laughs> So my answer is, I would absolutely speak out loud. I would make sure that you're not saying this horse is an idiot. He's so stupid, right? You want to make sure that you're saying, um, you're being mindful of your words in front of a horse. But I would also say that I think pictures are what really get through even more. So someone has asked where that horse is in Massachusetts. So, oh, um, <laughs> so Hunter. I cannot say enough about how much this horse has turned his life around. He would be, he's just the perfect safe horse for someone now. And he is an Ipswich mess. It's E-P-S-W-I-P-S-W-I-C-H. Ipswich, Massachusetts. And they can contact you to, for more information. He's so safe to be around. I would lie down next to him. Not that legally I'm recommending it, but, and just bomb proof with cars, dogs, kids, bicycles, anything and I just ride him in a halter. Yeah. So someone's asked about the energy field of a horse and how do you identify it initially? Um, I don't know what they what that person means about identify, but an animal has a huge energy field. And the more relaxed they are, I find the more I can feel it. When a horse, it's just like us, when we get really scared, it get we get very tight. And when a horse is deeply relaxed, like some of the videos I showed you, um, you put your hands, well, if you feel energy, you put your hands out pretty far and you can feel it. So that's, that, that's one answer. They, I find, and I'm not a certified energy worker for horses. Um, this is just something I, I incorporate, but I find it incredibly healing to put my hands uh, and, and get and, and, and transfer energy between the horse and the person. And I hope people take advantage of that opportunity. And it also can be really tiring. You can well, get- I, what, I, what I think we need to always recognize is that we are electromagnetic energy. Yeah. But, you know, I'm a scientist. And so I understand it from the level of looking at atoms and atoms have an energy field. And when you add lots of atoms together, you're obviously making that energy field larger. Um, and so the energy field can be influenced by different uh, uh, magnetics and different things and tension and fascia. You know, there's, it's all sort of interrelated. But I used to teach people a little exercise about just bringing their hands closer and closer together with their eyes closed. And most people would stop with about four inches between their hands and they could start to feel that their own energy field and feel the shape of it. Um, and so using that as a baseline, you, going back to us, and this is, you know, you bring up points that to me are so Feldenkrais-like. In order to feel, we have to reduce the effort. And the harder we try, the bigger the change has to be for us to feel. So as we reduce the effort and get really quiet and like listen to your tapes in a, in a more meditative state, that's when we're going to be open to more things. And right. the ability to, for us to ground, to be centered, to be grounded, to be present so that we can pick up on what's around us. 
Let's see, I'm, yeah. somebody said, I'm feeling a lot of heat off the right side of one horse. I'm not sure what to do with it. I've tried to release it, take it away and cool the area. Is this the way to handle this? Um, the mayor is a very head shy when she came six months ago. I would stick her on some surefoot pads actually. Yeah. Um, and I'd put her on whatever pad she's comfortable with. And I'd probably either use a physio pad or a hard pad because the pads, especially the hardened physio, have a very grounding effect. And we've actually, I've had another um, really interesting person in New Zealand stand on all the pads. And she said that the physio pad was super cooling, that it was very fascinating that she found that to be cooling and only that pad. And that's the one that I've put people on with head trauma and things. So, um, you know, you're wanting to let go of that heat and kind of transfer it down and out. So I would just suggest that. I love that because you, when I feel a horse on the pads, they are evening out left and right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, can you describe some of what you sense when horses are standing on pads? Well, it's one of my favorite things, and that's why I fell in love with you right away. I was watching <laughs> Wendy at, at Misty, and she put horses on pads, and all of a sudden I'm feeling so good because I feel like what it gives horses a chance to do is to change, to loosen their midline. We haven't even talked about that, but imagine and imagine um, being able to shift like this. Can you guys see me? And and what it does to your spine because it's allowing all those little fascial connections uh, to recenter and reorganize. So it's it's just allowing. And when we talk about energy, then it allows the energy to move. So somebody. Um... Uh, somebody just said the other day, instead of rubbing my horse, I went over his body about three inches away. At some places, my hand got warm. In other areas, it vibrated. Not sure what those feelings mean, but for people, not sure if it's real. Uh, if it's real, just feel it. Then learn to identify what it might mean. That's absolutely right. And that's what I just said. You don't worry about what you're feeling. It's when we start to analyze that we get in trouble. And when yeah. we just stay in the sensing part of our body and our brain of yeah. just experiencing Later, it'll start to make more sense, but we have to start out with honing our senses and developing our senses a little bit more, whether that's the sense of touch or ability to pick up heat or cool or tight or loose. And so that idea of just taking your hands, and this is something I learned way early with Linda Tellington Jones in 1985 when I first started working with her, is that uh, you just lightly take your hand over and just notice what you notice. And the more you start to be in the present moment observing, the more you're gonna feel. And some people may feel their hands get hot or cold and you can call it Reiki. Some people are trained in Reiki. But the bottom line is that we all have the ability to feel, we all have the ability to do this. We were born with it, it's innate into our nervous system. We just have to give it a chance. And whether that's animal communication or you know, the ability to perceive movement, we all kind of have a specialty, if you will, that we're more attracted to, but we all come with these um, abilities because we're all animals. We're all mammals and mammals are designed this way. And Vegas Nervous, one of my favorite things to talk about, but we're running out of time. <laughs> so we'll have to leave Vegas for another discussion. Um, so Laura, we're, we're literally, we're out of time. Do you want to say anything to kind of wrap this up? And um, well, and um, you know, my favorite thing, Wendy, is the relationship. And you're, you're doing that too. It's about the relationship. And I would say during this time when we're all feeling quaky, um, that, and sp having spoken to so many horses, they want to be in relationship. If that means all they get to do with you is because all you do is ride them, they'll be ridden. If you're willing to take them for a walk, they love nothing more than to be next to you. This is a lot that would say the majority, not all. Um, and so- It's always a bell curve. <laughs> it's a bell curve. But what I would just say to wrap it up is I hope everybody got some sense of how to move through this difficult time with their animals um, and feel good about it and feel good about their capacity to be able to meet this challenge and to communicate. So that's really glad everybody joined and it's nice yep. to talk to you. Thank you so much. This was kind of, uh, uh, it's really fun because we start off with sort of a little idea on a conversation, but we always wind up, all my guests, we wind up going wherever we're going. And I think that ability to just kind of go in a flow is really what makes these fun. I think they're, they're really enjoyable. And we didn't even talk about under saddle, which no, Wendy we and I have done. We did a cool clinic. We did this <laughs> clinic where Wendy would say, tell that horse to put his head down. And then I'd tell him that, and then she'd tell the rider to do this. And it was just real synergy.
Okay, right, thank you, Wendy. Yep, you're welcome. And thank you everybody for joining me. And at the end, I'll post this up on YouTube so you can have access to it. Tomorrow, my guest is Dr. Joyce Harmon. And then, um, who do I have on Thursday? Oh, Callie King on Thursday. And then I'm doing the intro to the, Felding, to the um, Surefoot Stability Program again, because I didn't record it. Um, and I actually have some other ideas planned. So stay tuned and thank you all for tuning in. Bye. Bye.